Muted. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some work that I did last year um, in my graduate studies at the University of Wisconsin looking at concentrating solar power cooling systems. Um, and I was able to lean on Sam to uh, make my job and my life a little bit easier. So I'll kind of focus on how I used Sam for that purpose. Um, so I guess to begin with, um, I'll give kind of an introduction to the water footprint of electricity generation, talk about wet cooling versus dry cooling and how that um, is important for CSP. Um, then I'll show you the baseline system advisor model that I use. And finally, um, really give you how I use SAM to help me, like I said, um, analyze concentrating solar power cooling. So here's a nice graphic from a, I think it was a USGS report on the water foot, footprint of electricity. In fact, this report was more generally on water withdrawals in the United States. And the main point being that the um, orange bar on the bottom is the withdrawal from uh, thermoelectric uh, generation, electricity generation, and it's the single largest uh, withdrawal source in the U.S. So that just points out how important um, water use in electricity is. I should say that that number, that, that piece of the pie looks very large because this is a withdrawal number, so it's not a consumption number, this, and they looked at the existing um, power plants across the U.S., many of which are older systems that have once through cooling that um, just withdraw water and recirculate it. And so although that water is not used, it's still impacted. And so that's included here. Um, I'll focus more on the consumptive use, but um, in general, just kind of wanted to give context to how important <coughs> this issue is. And I think we're all aware of, um, all aware of this issue. So. So to focus um, on concentrating solar power and dry cooling, um, first of all, water consumption is certainly an important issue where CSP is located in arid, you know, desert areas with high um, direct irradiance uh, resources. And so that's, that's what we're looking at here. And um, if you kind of a, a benchmark number, maybe I'll start with the overall number that the water footprint um, in general for electricity consumption is said to be about um, half a gallon per kilowatt hour or 500 gallons per megawatt hour. Um, so big numbers. If we look more specifically at wet cooled power plants, it's a little bit higher. You can get a kind of different um, specific numbers depending on where you pull from, but you can get back this number out just um, from the enthalpy of vaporiz vaporization of water. Um, and so we know it's you know around this, this magnitude. And it's a big number. Um, because of this, most CSP plants are moving um, in the future towards dry cooling systems, um, and that's good for water use, but there's some performance impacts. Um, two things, first, the, there's the um, parasitic loads for air cooling. Because you're pushing air instead of pumping water, your parasitic loads are somewhere like 3 to 5 percent of the power output, whereas if you were doing wet cooling, that would be much lower, um, maybe at around 1 percent if I remember correctly. And then the other, the other item is that there are also performance penalties. So not only is there additional parasitic loads from blowing air, but there's also performance penalties because you can't get um, as cold of a condensing temperatures with dry cooling as you can get with wet cooling. So what we're looking at is for concentrating solar power for CSP plants, um, what are some cooling system improvements that could happen? And I'm kind of going to benchmark from air-cooled systems because, as I said, that's where um, the you know current plants that are being built are, are moving towards using air cooling. So I'll think of that as my baseline and try to kind of improve on where those systems are right now. As I said, to make my life easier, um, I ran a system advisor model just um, to give me um, to give me what I needed to move forward with my analysis. Benchmark model was a 35 megawatt air-cooled parabolic trough plant. Um, tried to choose relatively normal plant configuration, um, thermal energy storage of six hours, solar multiple of two. Um, and then I'm showing you, related to that solar multiple, I'm showing you the um, solar field capacity and the peak power block output of 35 megawatts. And a couple details here about the solar collectors. Um, the type and size of those items, and then the total uh, collector area was uh, 275,000 square meters. Um, when I run this model in System Advisor, 
model. Um, Air-cooled air parasitic loads are around that 5% uh, benchmark, and then there's an additional parasitic loads of another 5%, so just to give um, some scope, some magnitude to that. To begin with, I looked at a peak summertime week. So I chose a uh, Tucson, Arizona location and a uh, poll, I think it was July week, uh, peak um, electricity loads and uh, peak um, solar resource, of course, during that week. And that's kind of what I started my analysis with um, just as a place to begin. So um, here's really what I did to, to lean on system advisor model, as I said. What I wanted to focus on for my analysis was the cooling system. So the um, box in the lower right-hand side um, here showing a cooling tower, but you know, as I said, I wanted to focus on um, different cooling systems. So to make my life easier and so I didn't have to implement my own um, solar field model and um, thermal storage model and power block model, what I did in SAM once I had that model running was output the um, heat, um, I think it's called the heat input to thermal input to the power block and you can get that value on an hourly basis um, and this is using um, a, a relatively straightforward dispatch schedule um, in system advisor model in terms of the hourly profile and then I can also get an hourly uh, thermal efficiency value and that's shown on the right hand side. So kind of the two boxes, the left hand side is what I wanted system advisor model to take care of for me. Um, I didn't want to have to choose and size the solar field um, and take care of all of that. Um, so I output that uh, heat input to the power block and then I, instead of modeling the power block, I just grab that thermal efficiency and assume that I'm not going to change anything about the way that power block is operating. Um, importantly for my work, I'm not going to change the condensing temperature at this point. Um, although certainly we might be interested in doing that in the future. So with this, it allows me to just determine, um, based on that thermal efficiency, what is an estimate of the heat rejection that's required to run that, um, that power plant. So this gives me an hourly um, profile for the week that I was looking at of the heat rejection required. And that's what that looks like for that peak July week. Um, hourly results show for this power plant, it was a 35 megawatt power plant at peak, as I mentioned, with a solar multiple of two. So the rejected heat is, I think it was an average of 58 megawatts, and there's a little bit of variance throughout the day based on how it's dispatched, um, et cetera. But this is the 168 hours that I looked at. So again, I take these numbers and then I model um, a condenser and a cooling system um, of my choosing to, to see how I can do in terms of reducing the parasitic loads. From the system advisor model hourly results, I can also estimate the uh, steam condensing temperature. That's a, not a direct output, as I recall, but I think the um, condensing pressure was output, so I can, I can use that and get the steam condensing uh, temperature, and that's shown here in the uh, dots. And then the ambient air for that week is shown in the green um, dotted line. And so that just shows over that week how this thing is running and with my assumption being that I can achieve that same um, condensing temperature with alternative um, condenser designs, um, I can compare the results. So I'm going to leave you hanging a little bit here in that I'm not presenting really detailed results on what I've found, um, partly because we're not completely done with it, but also because I just wanted to focus on how I'm using system advisor model. Um, but a couple of things that I wanted to mention um, as I kind of continue this project, the next things that we want to do with System Advisor model are, of course, to run that model year-round for that Tucson location, um, because I know that during different times of the year, a certain condenser size that looked good in July may or may not look good or maybe oversized at other times of the year. Um, I also want to try some different plant configurations, beginning with lower um, solar multiples and maybe moving to higher ones as well. Um, and then check other locations. So um, again, just look at different uh, input resources and see um, how a condenser that I may design for one location may perform in another location. And then, as I mentioned, I kind of use dry cooling as my benchmark model because I think that's the way things are moving. But I would also like to compare to wet cooled systems just to see 
Um, you know, ideally, there might be a design that uh, doesn't use a lot of water but can approach the performance of a wet cooled system. So, um, kind of working and comparing between wet cooled and dry cooled systems. Um, outside of System Advisor model, I, obviously, the other thing to look at is not only um, can I operate a plant with the same condensing temperatures, but can I do even better? And so, that I think I will have to either move outside of system advisor model or um, just get better at uh, tweaking um, the power plant operations in system advisor model to see if I don't have this condensing, uh, steam condensing temperature profile, if I have some other profile, how things will operate. Um, so in conclusion, this is um, a way that I've been able to use system advisor model to um, kind of lean on it and make my analysis a little bit easier and really focus on what I want to focus on which is just the cooling system itself. Um, and there's a couple of uh, resources shown here um, that I also uh, cited in the presentation. So. Great. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, we now, of course, will open up the floor for questions. And if anyone has anything they'd like to ask, please type it into the chat window. Be what would you like to see changed about? So this is Nate Blair uh, in the room, and uh, I think my question is based on your use of the CSP um, systems in SAM as a more of a from a student perspective. What do you think? Do you have any thoughts on what we could do to improve the usability or um, you know things that you came across while you were learning to use SAM? Yeah, um, well, it was very helpful for us, for sure. Um, I did work with another student um, during some points of the year, and we found that there was a couple things that would have helped us um, as we were kind of outputting values from System Advisor model. There were some things that um, would have been helpful to see, uh, mass flow rates in the power block, um, temperatures in the power block at different points. I know some of those details maybe you can't exactly extrapolate the way that, you're, the, way that the CSP model is really done inside SAM, but right. more of those values that would allow from a student perspective allow us to say, okay, I can build um, a power block model on my own in a different piece of software and I can get temperatures and pressures anywhere I want. And then I can build it in SAM and like I, I, as a student I kind of want to see, oh yeah, that works. Like we are doing the same thing. We are getting the same pressures and temperatures and flow rate, that kind of thing. So, Okay. Yeah. So more outputs at Particular points along the uh, around the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure there are some limits to what we can get, but it would be helpful. So, yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, so one other question. Do we have time for another question? Yes. So the other question would be to the CSP modeler in the room, Ty Nysis. So I think we're there's proposals at least to move more in the direction of supporting solar field only uh, analysis. Um, in other words, so that you can get sort of the thermal output yeah, very easily and and or kind of break up the system at different points. And is that true? And where are we at in terms of that? process. Right, so it would be useful, especially for the solar field, to decouple its performance from what's happening with the power cycle right. and thermal storage so the user really understands just what's happening with the solar field. Um, that is proposed, but whether that results in funding, we don't know. All right. Yeah, so for those of you that have been in, in here uh, all day, I, I meant, briefly mentioned that we had some CSP proposals in uh, for the upcoming uh, years to DOE, and that's one of the things that we proposed to them, and we hope to hear <coughs> soon on uh, on whether or not that would be going ahead. Um, and note that once once we hear from DOE uh, later this summer, hopefully, uh, we will um, post on the SAM website sort of a our kind of three-year plan for development, um, uh, so that people can understand what we've. 
uh, got in the pipeline, which I think is often very helpful for students to know, geez, maybe I don't need to build this if they're going to come out with it next year. So, um, so I think that um, just wanted to raise that issue. Okay. Yeah, I would second that. Um, I don't know where the idea originally came from, but being able to isolate the solar field would be, for me, pretty cool. So. Yeah, I think there's more interest in looking at industrial process heat as well as hybrid systems. And, you know, sometimes it, you can take the, at least the thermal output from SAM and then link it to any number of kind of crazy hybrid configurations okay. potentially. Yeah, yeah. Those are a couple of the initial needs.